Uh, and hi, Philly suburbs. Great to see you, Gabrielle, Massachusetts. Elaine, hi, Elaine. Great to see you. Oh, hi, Wendy and Kathleen. So good to see everybody. It is four, it's a little after four, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. But um, definitely, uh, you know, be reminded that the chat box is open. And I do wanna say a shout out to Donald who's helping us with the technology and also managing the chat box for us today. Uh, before I introduce our wonderful guest today, I wanna um, just announce a couple of things. You know, if you're not on my email list, please do get on that me email list because that's really where you're gonna find out um, about what's going on. Uh, and that's gonna be uh, dthomasfineministers.com. I do have a small talk lecture coming up that's happening on the 3rd, which is next Sunday, and it'll be a four o'clock in the afternoon uh, webinar. Uh, that's per, that's a pay for, pay for event, that's, not, that's at $9.99. Um, but I'm also doing a mini news and views, which is something that's new for me, but it's sort of like an online magazine format. I'm doing it on Facebook. I might change the platform um, if it doesn't suit everyone, but um, I'm gonna be doing a mini news and views, a very special edition of one. It'll be a recap of the year in miniature. So I'll be doing recapping of the biggest events that uh, are notable for 2020 or 2020. Um, so that's happening on Facebook. We'll put the link in the box on how you can go and um, not join because this is a free event on Facebook, but at least get interested and you'll get all the reminders that it's happening. Um, so those are two of the biggest things. Also, last the last Meet the Miniaturist uh, webinar has been posted, the replay of it. That includes all the winners from the biggest little Christmas showdown. Um, really fun Meet the Miniaturist. It's on my YouTube channel now. We'll go ahead and put the links in the in the chat box to that as well. So you can go and watch the replay if you missed it live. Um, really, really fun one. Um, and just another, just a quick one. I, I administrate a Facebook group page called Mini Friends. Um, it's got a nice following. It's over like six and a half thousand folks on it. I'm looking for administrators who might wanna partner with me to grow that, um, that site or that group because it's got a really nice strong base, but I'm, I, I find it a lot. It's really difficult for me to manage by myself. And I'm looking for um, some administrators out there who will work with me to really make that, you know, make that go to the next level, uh, you know, as a, a community page on Facebook. So yeah, let, reach out to me um, if you're interested in partnering up on that. Um, but without any further ado, I want to introduce Fran Sussman from um, Some Like It Small. Yay! And thank her so much for being here. And um, I think this is going to be exciting. So like, uh, so if you don't know anything about Fran, just like top line, Fran, what I find so amazing about Fran is not only her work, but how she got to that, her work. You know, your background and your, your you know, your background in math and economics and applying that to miniatures is just that is what just blows me away so let's get into that let's hear about you fran before we actually see all your wonderful work in 144th okay. scale which you know is a whole nother trip and a half which i can't wait to get to so so fran first thank you for joining us and tell us all about yourself <laughs> okay well it's fantastic to be here darren thanks very much um I've always liked small things. I don't know, I've probably everybody who ever does miniatures always starts out with saying, I've always liked small things. But um, when I first got interested in doing stuff in this scale, uh, aside from just like random things that I would do, was when I was about nine or 10 years old and I had an art teacher who had us build a model of a house using math board and other stuff. And of course he didn't like what I did. It wasn't creative or whatever, but he was very supportive. And I got home and I said, wow, this thing is, was fun. I loved building this thing, but it was like, you know, I don't know if you can see me like this big. Yeah. And um, uh, I thought, what if I can make something smaller? So I got out my, you know, art supplies, which in those days consisted of that brown paper that you would lick and stick, uh, index cards, random fabrics, some of which I'm sorry to admit was pink. 
um, and other stuff. And I made like a little, I started making little houses that were, you know, like about three inches in size. And I went to the art store and I found this little ruler that was in tenths of an inch rather than eighths of an inch. Or, and later I found one that was twelfths of an inch. Um, and so just started using that. And what I found I really loved was doing the interiors. And that's always been the part that's really fascinated me. And although I've always liked the whole model railroad thing as well, um, they don't really focus that much on interiors. And so, you know, that was the thing that was just really special for me. So this is what I'm struck by because you, you a lot of people go from 12 scale down to 144. So that just amazes me that you went right to the tiny scale. You were drawn to the really, really always, tiny. Always like the tiniest stuff. Which which has a whole nother level of difficulty to it, which is really interesting. But but you gravitated towards that really, really small scale. I mean, I think what I really like about it, and again, when, you know, I, I think you're right, it does have a little bit to do with my background is, I mean, any miniature, whether it's a room box, it's this big or this big, or even a room that you walk into in a house, the first thing you see is what the, what the whole room looks like. Yeah. And then you start looking around it and start, um, looking at the details and you start picking up the details and for me what's especially fun about these little rooms is just that that's really what you do you see the whole thing at once and then little by little your eye starts picking out the details i was i have a, a toy shop that i'll show you later and i'd shown it to a friend of mine who didn't know anything about miniatures and he, he picked it up and was you know sort of holding it like gingerly you know like people do when you actually should hold a miniature firmly you yeah. know so, so that you don't drop it so he was looking at it and he was sort of frowning and turning it around this way and that way and he said oh my god look at that little chair did you see that did you know that was there there's a little yeah. chair in there so you know I, it's that little that moment when people realize there are details there that yeah. i really enjoy yeah. And I've always been really, as you're saying, I've always been really comfortable with the whole idea of scale. My, my, bath, my background was in economics, so I was working a lot with spreadsheets and uh, modeling. And there's a lot of sort of thinking about, you know, how do you change behavior? How do you get people? Like I worked in the environment. So how do you get people or corporations to do what you want? So there's always this sense of kind of problem solving and getting to your goal and using math, which is great for, for this scale to, if you can be comfortable, sometimes I'm in millimeters, sometimes I'm in inches. I'm yeah. always multiplying things in my head. So, yeah. you know, I think, I think that that's a lot has to do with my approach. It's sort of a problem solving approach and a, a very sort of, how do I look at a thorn room and how do I then take that thorn room and make it, you know, this big? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're, you have these natural skills that definitely lend themselves to, to working not only in 12 scale, but then when you get to this tiny, tiny scale, you, you know, those skills really, really need to kick in. And then you have this whole patience and, and creativity. And yeah, there's a whole, well, both sides of the brain are working diligently, <laughs> but so, okay. So, so there, so there came a time that you started making miniatures, like spending more time making miniatures. Yeah. After, uh, I, I think a lot had to do with when kind of the internet was really getting going and being more of a true source of information as opposed to just something that was out there. So it was around, well, I thought I was the only person doing this, you know, cause I didn't know anybody who did this. And then I was uh, in London um, for work in the late nineties. And I happened to be there when the Kensington Dollhouse show was there and I saw it was in the newspaper. So I went and I saw Nell Corkin's work for the first time. So I realized, first of all, I am not alone. Secondly, this is a thing. And <laughs> thirdly, oh my God, this is the kind of quality that's possible. Although I had moved on from, you know, pink fabric and index cards by that point. Um, yeah. So that was, that was really a bit of a moment. And then in a few years after that, um, I was wandering around the internet and I started and doing a little bit of searching and I started to find out some of the people that were doing more popular 1144. There was uh, Frances Armstrong. Um, she died a few years ago, but her family still keeps up her, her website, which has a lot of tutorials. And her approach really spoke to me because what she tried to do was make things as realistic as possible. You know, so if she had to make a strainer, she would make it a strainer that had that would strain. It might be a little bit 
big. So she was willing to sacrifice a little bit of scale in order to bring some realism. She also liked using all uh, uh, real materials, which is yeah. what I like. I always try to use wood or fabric or I have needlepoint in my thorn rooms, you know. Yeah. So what was her name again? Because I just want to put it in the box so people uh, can find Francis her. Francis Armstrong. Francis Armstrong. Okay. And um, and I I just want to answer one question from one of the uh, attendees wants us wants to say how 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 can you change the screen? You guys have the ability to look at whatever you want to on your screen, so you can go ahead into your menu and you can you can click on any any um any frame you want, if you want to see anyone bigger, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so, all right, so didn't, you didn't even know this whole this whole world existed right. to this level, and then you took a deep dive and you're like, okay, I'm inspired, right. I'm inspired. And I found the Micro Minis, what, well, back then, the Yahoo group, uh, which was all folks, uh, Anita McNary LaHue really popularized this early on, because she was one of the first people doing laser, laser cut, uh, houses and yeah. furniture and her designs are now all being produced by SDK miniatures. All right, what was her name again? Anita McNary, M-C-N-A-R-Y. Perfect, I'm just gonna pop that in, in the box. L-A-H-U-E. L -A -H -U -E. L one more time, L-A-H-U-E. <laughs> but uh, SDK miniatures, Susan Karachis is the okay. one who uh, now has her designs. And right. I made some really good friends uh, because a lot of miniatures, as everyone knows, is having somebody you can kind of bounce ideas off of. So I, through the Micro Minis group, I became friends with uh, Virginia Payton in Australia, who used a scroll saw to cut out all of her patterns and was incredibly precise in what she did. Um, actually, because I'm kind of a tool hound, I bought one of the scroll saws that she uses and have not used it. And, um, uh, so uh, Virginia Payton was another one, and uh, Anna Corin Betson. Okay. Um, I can send you. I sent. I sent you an email with with a link to to her website. I bet you didn't send Donald. Um, she's uh, a computer person. I can't remember if she's hardware or software or both by training and inclination. And so her work is incredibly precise, and she has wonderful little do-it-yourself. Uh, tutorials on. So I met all those people, realized there was a world out there and started interacting and finding out about ways to do stuff. And then when I retired, uh, well, uh, this story is getting long. Let me see if I can speed up. <laughs> and then in uh, 2008, I had another friend, Julia Murray, who I knew through that group, but she doesn't do much miniatures anymore that I know of anyway. Um, although she does makes beautiful jewelry, she wanted to get a lathe and start doing miniature turning. So she and I did a little bit of looking into that. And then she found Pete and Pam Borum. And so they uh, came to my house with two lathes, set them up, spent the day teaching me and Julia how to work on a lathe, um, packed hers up and, and shipped it off. And um, and then Pete said, you know, you really should go to Guild School, ah. which is the IM, IGMA school in Castine, Maine every um, summer. And you really should go because there's going to be, uh, Rob Tukum is teaching turning there. Right. And, um, and I said, okay, I can take off from work. And I went to Guild School and I have not looked back. I mean, basically I have been there every year since and a couple of years after that. I applied to be an artisan and in small scale and yeah. did that. And just, it's just been a tr tremendous resource for learning about how to use materials, tools, meeting people, um, and just improving the quality of your own work. I did, mean, did, did you ever, did you ever think, cause I do want to like recognize that you, you know, not only found this world, but then you created, you know, you got yourself to a level to be an Enigma artisan, which is kind of great. When you think about it, did you ever think you would you would get to that place? No. When you started dabbling? No, certainly not when I started dabbling, and even when I applied, um, I it took me like it took me over a year to do the. Uh, I was working full time, so maybe it took me like two years. I mean, it took a long time to do the pieces that I submitted to be an artisan, and. Um, uh, I was really I was and I. The, the process of actually trying to produce those pieces and yeah. bring the quality up as high as I could was tremendously instructive. 
both about what was I doing? Why was I doing it? What was I looking for? What are the materials I can use? When am I willing to sacrifice scale, not knowing if you know the judges would be willing to sacrifice scale? Um, what's my philosophy here? And so that process in and of itself, I, I learned a huge amount from. And I also knew that the judges are gonna come back with, um, with you know, point whether or not they award you an artisanship, they're gonna come back with uh, things you need to work on. And so that was gonna be really helpful as well, I felt. And what so was, what was some of the most I was trying to have a very good attitude. What was some of the more surprising feed feedback that you got? Did anything um, surprise you? Most of the feedback had to do with scale, a few things that were off scale. Um, all of which I agreed with, except for one thing that I thought was absolutely adorable and somebody didn't like, you know, it's sort of like what happened on, you know, on that HDTV show, you know, right. your little favorite thing, but that was fine. That was fine. Um, and uh, uh, so that, so that was really, and a lot of very positive feedback that they really enjoyed uh, learning about my process. And I think I actually helped educate them a little bit because yeah. most people had not thought about how do you judge something in this scale? You can't judge it the way you judge a thorn room. You have right. to judge it in a different way. So, so, but you were not the first, what category did you obtain your artists instead? Um, it was, they, they had to do small scales because usually like Nell was an artisan in um, Nell Corkin was an artisan in structures, I think. Uh -huh. And because that's, she, but I didn't have any structures. I wasn't building any houses or anything at that time. I only had interiors. So, so they were very nice and created this scale. And, and now they, I, you know, and I think, and, you know, I had to develop criteria for it. So were you the first? And what was the, what was the category? So, yeah. 141? And there have been a several ever since, uh, several since then. There have. That's pretty awesome. I love it. I do, I would, I do want to take a, a question before we Sure. Move on, because I want to I uh, want to hold on to inspiration. Like, what inspires you to work on a specific project? And actually, that that is one of the questions. You know, when you when I want to talk about process first before we get into what inspires okay. you. What is your process when you when you figure out that there's something new you want to work on? Where's your um, head go? What what inspires you first? Well, I guess. Well, th there are categories of things I love. I love shops. I love interiors. I love the thorn rooms. I love work rooms that people are working on. So, and like a lot of miniatures, you know, I get all excited about one thing, then something else comes along and then I actually end up working on that. So, but everything I work on is kind of within those categories. So I'll, I just, you know, I really, so for example, I have a, a toy shop. Uh -huh. You can put the toy shop in there so people have something else to look at. Um, let me see, is that, is that showing up a bit? Yeah, yep, definitely can see it. So I'll turn it around so the inside is, is there. Let me back it up a little bit. So I wanted to do this toy shop. So I just started, I mean, everywhere I go, I take photos. Um, so I have uh, photos of storefronts I like, photos of how a window is arranged, photos of how the interior of a shop might be arranged. Um, so I understand how far are things apart. I mean, and when you do a miniature, you do change things a little bit because you might leave more space than would be there in reality. But so I'm always, but I'm always taking photos. And so right. when I sat down to do a toy shop, the first thing I did was I went through all my photos to see what appealed to me. And in these photos I took, what was it I liked about the window? What is it I would want to be able to capture later? Or what, um, what appealed to me about the organization of the shop or what appealed to me about the exterior or, or whatever it was. Why did I take that picture and what can I take from it? And then for this shop, in fact, I sort of, I, I didn't have an exterior that I really, really liked. And so what I ended up doing was continuing to search for toy shops. And I found a toy shop that uh, Pat and Noel Thomas had done called Faces of the Moon. Mm -hmm. And were they to look at this, I don't think they would recognize the, that Faces of the Moon was the inspiration, but I wrote them and asked them if they minded. And so uh, ended up using that as kind of the inspiration for the exterior, uh, you know, beat up. Yeah. Lots of shingles, um, a so little that's a real, bit. That's a real place somewhere. Is that what we're saying? Is it inspired by a Oh, real it's, a, it's a Pat Noel Thomas uh, 
a toy shop that they built for a customer. Oh, and okay. so they had that on uh, the blog spot that they have. They right. had uh, pictures of it and their process. So, um, so this one is called Toys on 10th, uh, has a different name because it's supposedly on 10th Street in Brooklyn. Right. Oh, ten. <laughs> so that's the exterior. Did, do you mind yeah. showing us the, inter the no, interior? Let me see if I can do a good job of that. And then I also noticed the copper roof, which is pretty awesome. Oh, that's fun, right? Let oh, no, that's there. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, it's actually really helpful that you're you're holding it up because it's really now and it's really it it's in focus. Oh my god! And there's a tiny dollhouse in there, two of them. Yeah, those are some of those are card models. Some of them are Arnold Volker kits. He makes some wonderful kits. So what scale is that? <laughs> uh, oh gosh, can I do that quickly? It's it's twelve times one forty four, which is I don't know what is that. 2000 a lot <laughs> it's many something. numbers i don't know i don't know what it is but something like that no one one five two six maybe so I don't how, know. Long, how long does it take you to complete a piece like this that took about six months six months because I there's a lot there's a lot of trial and error you know like one of the things i had to figure out was you know was i going to light this or how was i going to make it so that it could be lit was I gonna do that thing that people do where you sort of open up and have a second floor, you know, open up part of the roof. So there was a lot of, you know, that was part of the figuring out. And I decided to go with those slots so that light would come through uh, rather than having to. Um... Uh, someone just did the numbers, seven, 1728. 1728, right, sorry, I should have. Thank uh, there you, I am stop. saying I'm good with numbers and I blew it. Um, so, so what are the, what are the materials that you use in, in here? Like, well, let's see for this one. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, this one has a lot of, um, a lot of different things. I mean, what is the wood? What is the floor? Like the that floor is actually, uh, the floor is actually, uh, uh, decking that is made for ships because I liked it because it had a lot of, it's um, laser cut and laser printed. And so it had a lot of sort of slats. And I a lot of slats, slat uh, yeah. So, so that is that. Although I have on occasion taken tiny strips of wood and made my own flooring. But for this case, um, I use that. There's a lot, there's some 3D printed things in there and some stuff from Grantline who does, you know, model railroad stuff. Copper yeah. roof that I kind of shaped and made the lines in, you know, made the lines in to make it look like a roof. Right. And then uh, age. Um, one of the materials I like using is called Paylight, which okay. is actually a foamed PVC that is a fairly stiff sheet. And so that's what I like to use for the bases of these um, because it's nice and stiff and you can glue to it with CA glue. Um, it's just, this is uh, some of the stuff inside is scratch built. Some uh -huh. of it I found 3D printed. Some of it, um, I have to look. <laughs> Do you use any <laughs> polymer clay? Do you work with clay at all? N not much. Not much. I've used clay for uh, cobblestones and things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so this is, it's partly scratch built. It's partly kits. One of the challenges in this was I wanted to put a lot of things in it. And I wanted it to look busy, but I didn't want it to look messy. Yeah. And so I actually used more things that were um, manufactured than I normally do because they would have a slightly cleaner look. Like yeah. most yeah. stuff, most of the time, I like to pretty much scratch build things. So for example, this little workroom, uh. I can get that. Yes. Let me see if I can get that somewhere where you can see it. I guess I need to hold it. Do you, do you mind? Is it is it hard for you to hold it up right in front? Well, it just I just feel like people's eyes are they as it goes in and out of focus, their eyes are going to go in and out of focus. Um, right. This was pretty much all scratch built, meaning oh you know using things, putting it together, using wood. The workbench was something I designed out of styrene and then cast. Oh. You know, so this was supposed to be kind of messy because most people's basements 
do have, um, you know, some shelves that just stuck up by themselves or right. a table that was just a big board that they put on top of some uh, uh, sawhorses. So you, you talked a little bit about what the sacrifices are when you go that small. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, you know, detail is you're going to lose some detail, but what are the things that you make, a, say, a conscious decision to forego? I don't know. Like, do you decide? All right, I'm not going to have that level of detail or like, what's what's your point of view I on that? E each time it's a little bit different, you know, so again, in the in the toy shop, I decided that I was going to forego building everything myself. Um, what do you, what do you give up? I mean, uh, you, you know, overall it's detail that you are giving up because right. you're, you're always giving up detail. But so it, oh, I think a lot of times it's sort of like some detail is very hard to do well. Like I'm trying to think, I know in the toy store, I wanted to do, you know, built-ins with designs in them. Cause I think in the Pat and Noel Thomas version, the built-ins had, you know, like, uh, scallops around the edges and so I was working on doing that and I could kind of do it but I couldn't do it as well as I liked right. and so if you're putting detail in but the detail isn't good it's going to be distracting yeah so sometimes I think it's better to leave detail out if it's going to be poorly done and therefore distracting right but other than that I try and pull whatever detail I can because that's kind of the fun of it yeah we got a great question from Lisa Joy in terms of what are um, she would love to see some of the tools that you use, but okay. my question would be, what are, what are some of your favorite tools? So maybe we can answer both. Okay. Um, do you have a tool you can share and what are your favorite tools? Well, I can also like, oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> One of my favorite tools is, um, if you're ever working with brass, particularly etched brass and you need to fold it, um, this place called the small shop makes a lot of really, really wonderful, wonderful tools for um, folding. And I don't have a piece of brass here, but basically you loosen the top, you put the piece of brass under that, you retighten it, you bring a uh, razor blade usually and, and fold it up. And so it's a great way mm -hmm. of folding things, um, being sure that you are getting a good straight line along the crease. Um, and I've used it for folding cardstock. I've used it for folding brass. I've used it for folding a lot of stuff. Oh, I like that one a lot. That Where did you get that? The small shop it's called, and they're really nice people. And they, um, they have several tools. They have a smaller one than this. They have a bigger one than this, but this is my favorite size. They also have another tool, which I don't have handy for rolling curves. Um, so that's one of those tools that I probably would never ever use, but I want to have it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, like my scroll saw that I got because of my friend Virginia. Some things um, you just want to have because can we talk a little bit about the thorn runes? I, I don't, I, you know, that's the other, th the other thing that like super got me loving your work was the thorn rooms. Can you just talk a little bit about that before we get to that? We'll get to those tools too, Yeah. but I don't want to forget. I just want people to have something to look at. Oh. <laughs> so the, the thorn rooms, talk a little bit about that piece. What would you, uh, what went into it? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, well, cause um, like, I, I mean, I think, the, so the, those were three room boxes, right? Inspired right. by the thorn rooms. So that the rooms themselves were 12 scale, but the boxes were 144. But they actually were one one twentieth, so it was a tenth oh. of an inch equals a foot. So that gives you a little bit extra to play with. It's just a little bit bigger. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That was just awesome. I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. All right, so let's talk about those tools. So the other the other tools that are your favorite? Well, right now, I think it depends on what I'm doing. And I think I was telling you that I'm working on uh, filling a baby house that Jeff Wanacott Yes. So I yes. can show that to folks and, and uh, if people are, you know, how you like that and stuff. But right now I'm working on furniture. So no, I, again, we, I like to use real wood. So these are great saws. One of them is a Japanese saw that I got from a Japanese website. The other is Japanese, but it's, um, let me see if I can get that. It's called the Ninja Pro S and it's from FlexiFile who make a lot of really good tools. And it's, incredibly, I don't know if it shows up just how the blade is 
incredibly thin. The teeth are incredibly fine, but it's also very sharp. And, and so, what do you use that for? Um, if I'm cutting really like, this is 164 thick lumber. Wow. And so if you cut it with a, uh, cut it with your uh, craft knife, it's going to splinter, even if you try and do it very, very slowly. But if you use the saw, you can cross cut across the grain and not have it crack. Wow, so that's a great pro tip. To do that. But that's if there's if there was a way that lets me buy a new tool, you know, as my family can attest. <laughs> we did get a question about what kind of wood do you use? So what, what kind of wood do you use? And what was that wood that you just had? Well, interestingly, I thought this was a wood called Per Pernambuca. And I just wrote to SH Good. I, I know if people know them uh, to get more because I wanted to get some different thicknesses. And I sent him a photo and he said, this, I'm not sure this is Pernambuca. So he's going to be, uh, I'm sending him a piece and he's going to tell me what it is. Well, whatever it is, it's beautiful. And I don't I mean, think I've ever seen it before. It's gorgeous. Did it come stained like that or did you put yeah, a finish? It's just, I just, I just buffed it up. Um, this is Amboina Burl, which yeah. is uh, very, very pretty. And I'm using that now too. It also buffs up very, very nicely, very shiny. Um, ebony. I'm going to put the ebony. wood source in the chat box. It's SH Good, right? Right. I, yep. G-O-O-D-E, right? Yes. He's, that's a great source. He's got everything yeah. or they got everything. Amazing. So yeah. can we talk a second about the, the scale of the wood? Because the wood that you just shared, they look appropriate for 12 scale or 144. Well, yeah, they're about, sometimes I'll put it through my thickness sander and I can get it down to like 0.012 inches. 164th is about 0.015 inches. And in this scale, that's like two inches thick. But one of the things you can do in 1144th is everything doesn't have to be perfectly to scale because your eye couldn't even see it. Right. I have a friend who does model railroad stuff and he had a very good way I thought of describing it, which is that when you're like, say you're doing like in 144th, the, uh, the, there's sort of a curb, a curb here. And that curb is, I don't know, is probably you know, a foot tall. It's definitely taller than a curb would be in real life. But he says what the railroad folks do is they'll make the curb be taller because part of what happens is if you are looking at a model train layout and you are three feet away, three feet away times 160 is, you know, you're actually a block away when you're looking at this. So if you were a block away from something, a curb would not be visible to you. Uh -huh. So he said that a lot of times in model railroad stuff, you're working with how the eye sees rather than how the camera sees. Interesting. And so the, so That's it's, fascinating. Um, well, I think that goes back to my question. What do you sacrifice? You know, because sometimes you don't need to have the detail because your eye's never gonna see it. But, but you know, you didn't have to have that curb, but you did put the curb there. Right. Um, I don't know, you, I guess you just think about what's really essential to give the feel of the place. I mean, in the toy store, I, what I sacrificed was clutter because right. I really wanted the toy store to look like kids had left books lying around. And somehow that just wasn't working. So it ended up being a toy store that somebody had just tidied up. Yeah. But I made the work area on the right hand side look messier than the toy area. So, you know, you certainly you sacrifice detail. Um, you sacrifice yeah. sanity, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> and I would argue those are the details that that make that make you move from just a piece to an, an art, because mm -hmm. you are really crafting and com you're composing that so that it gets seen a certain way, and you feel a certain way. So that's what makes it art. But I love it. Okay, so so we're gonna get to see the baby house sure. that you're working on. So. And I think it, it, it's um, it's important to, to to talk about how that piece is actually a hybrid. And part of it was from a class, right. a Jeff Wanakai class, and part of it is now you're finishing it with the 144th piece, right? Yep. So let me let me put the take a moment. I meant to do this before and stick the door sure. on. While you're doing that, I will thank um, uh, Lisa for. Oh, Leslie, sorry. Leslie put in the chat box what the name of the wood is called. It's called Pernambuco. 
Yeah. And she said it's the same wood that's used to make violin bows. Yes. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And used to make dyes. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. So did um, I. And Allegra also <laughs> put it in there as well. Thanks, Allegra, for that information. Um, just checking to see if there are any other questions we can ask. Um, oh, this is an interesting. Joanne said um, that ladybug Soothwaite always used to say that when working in small scales, you go for illusion over detail. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a great way to say it. Um, yeah, and that's where the art comes in because you're creating- Yeah, it's illusion. sort of the, yeah, the- um... You're creating something that's not really there. <laughs> and that's the difference between creating a perfectly yeah. scaled chair in miniature, which is awesome, but right. what you do right. with that perfectly scaled chair. All right, so we're looking at the baby house. So this is what it will look like someday. Uh -huh. This is it's not a what it looks like. Yeah, it's not what it'll look like right now. Um, so yeah, this was a class that Jeff Wanicott taught at uh, Tom Bishop's show. Uh -huh. And um, I wanted to be able to light it and put room boxes in it. Oh, but look at that. It's really, one of the problems is you come home with a baby house <laughs> and a lot of times people will end up, you know, running the wires down the outside and being really frustrated and not liking the look. Or you can... Yeah. build out the outside a little bit is another way you can do it. But what I decided to do was run the wires down the inside of the baby house. Right. Meant so that's what all the holes are in the back, right? Yeah. And I'll take out some of this, some of these boxes. So in, so, so the, the structure itself is what you did in the class. It was an right. unfinished, undecorated baby house. Right. It's just, it was just wood. It had, uh, Jeff had actually given us some uh, stairs that oh. I uh, uh, ended up not using because I wanted to be able to furnish the rooms. But yeah, so they, so basically what I did was I ran the wires down inside the house, but because it had a back on, and I think you can see the wires running down the, uh, the top. Um, Talk a little bit about how you, you mentioned that you were going to put lights in, but then th that you had to change direction in how you were doing the, the rooms. You had to actually create boxes that come out. Oh, there it is lit. Yeah, oh the, um, uh, yeah just very quickly. So I would just made holes in the back and then kind of uh, dug into the back of the shelf so the wires could all run down the back. And then the LEDs, you play, you know, again, it's all experimentation. You play around till you find something that lights it up enough. And the problem is that these LEDs, I think, are the three millimeter LEDs that um, uh, Evan Design sells. And so they ended up kind of puffing down the ceiling. Okay. And I couldn't make a drop ceiling because these walls aren't, aren't that tall because they were based on what was a real uh, baby house. So I ended up having to build um, notches in the back of every one of the room boxes oh, so they can wow. be lit in under the bulging out LEDs. And then when everything is decorated and stuck in, I'm gonna have to get in there with some tiny tweezers and put the very last piece of molding in. Yeah, no, I think that's really smart anyway to have the, the, the rooms come out because what if you wanna redecorate them? It's right. <laughs> just saying. Well, and it makes it much easier, much easier to decorate something that you can hold in your hand like this yeah. than to decorate something that's inside a hole. So it's how many rooms? One, two, oh, it's how many rooms? Nine. Nine rooms. Although, yeah. And did you use paper to wallpaper the rooms? I see the yeah. murals. The murals actually are from Alison Davies uh, in the UK, and she was a sweetheart. She asked me how tall I wanted them to be. I gave her the measurements, and she printed her murals that she sells, two of them, uh, at you know just like under an inch tall, 22 millimeters or whatever this was, and printed them for me. Well, that's incredible. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's awesome. And then that the is others are wonderful. printed on my home printer, pretty much. So how far along do you think you are on that piece? <laughs> oh, percentage-wise, time-wise. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm at the, the part that I that I that I have a lot of fun, which is which is furnishing. Right. Um, if, if I don't yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen with Bishop's show. I I doubt that I'll be 
done with it in time for Bishop's show if it, if it does occur, but um, I should definitely have it um, ready for the Guild show in, in the fall. It's a perfect shot right there. That's so great. Um, so we did get another question about um, planer. What kind of planer do you use? I guess that's a, a material, right? I mean, that's a, the planer. <laughs> oh, that's probably from my friend, Jeff. Um, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, it's, a, I don't actually, I do have a planer, like many tools, like you said, you have all these tools that you then don't use. I do have a planer, but I haven't actually set it up and use it. Um, I'll get wood from SH Good, that's roughly the thickness I want. And then I have a thickness sander that's from uh, Burn Model Machines, B-Y-R-E, B-Y-R-N-E. They make, uh, they only make like three or four miniature tools. It's more for the model ship folks. Okay. And they, make, they make a thickness sander. And so you can, I'll run something through, say something is a 32nd of an inch thick and I want to take it down to, you know. Uh, Half of that. 025 <laughs> or something like that. And um, I'll just be able to run it through the thickness sander a few times and it'll be a very even, very nice job. I love that. Um, two other questions. Do you work on commission? Would you take, yeah? Well, I've only been doing, I've only been at shows for about two, three years. So um, not that many people know me, but I certainly, if somebody has something and I think it's something I can do, you know, I'd be happy to do that. Awesome. Um, I have done commissions for flowers and, and some things like, and plants and trees yeah. and things like that. You but. also teach, is that right? I've taught at uh, Bishop Show and the Guild Show and Philly Miniaturia. So, okay. and I and I like teaching. I love yeah. a, lo a lot of times people will take a class and they are terrified because they'll say, there's no way they can do this, no way. And little by little, you bring them to the point where they really, they see everything they need to see. Yeah. And if they're really nervous, I might do something for them. But the best thing is when you get that aha moment and somebody who was scared of the class, then, um, you know, does it all themselves. And then they're back for the next class, you know, and yeah. they're, they're an old timer. And it's just a wonderful thing. See, I know you also take class, like you said, you go back every year to the Guild School, which is right. awesome. Um, what's next for you in terms of what do you want to learn? What do I want to learn? Yeah. Um, I'd like to continue to improve my turning skills. Mm. Um, I, oh, uh -huh. painting, watercolor Paint. painting. In miniature. Yeah, I would like to, so yeah, I'm signed up for a Brooks class. And I'm before Brooks class at the Guild School in the, the miniature watercolor, uh, watercolor painting. I'm going to take a watercolor class at the local community college that's online between now and then. Um, I've always been interested in watercolors. Again, I'm not a trained artist and I don't necessarily think of myself as very artistic, but there, one of the things I really love about this scale is that you don't have to be expert at anything. You just have to be patient. Yeah. So I'm not the best full scale furniture maker you'll meet. I'm not even that good a one, but in 1144, I don't have to have the skills of Jeff Wanacott. I need different skills. Yeah. So the same thing with clay or needlepoint or silverwork or furniture you know, so painting is yet one more thing. And I just love that it requires patience and a willingness and you get to work with everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's out there. That's awesome. So what is it, what's a dream project for you? Do you have like a list of things you that you want to get to, but like, if you had to move that up to the top, what would it be? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, you know, like, a, like it always happens, things rotate. There are some shops I want to make. I want to make a bookstore. There are some classes that uh, I want to develop. Um, definitely uh, more thorn rooms or now that I'm even better, I think, you know, remake the thorn rooms that I made because they're some of my favorites. Um, I think it's probably uh, shops and thorn rooms and a series of little vignettes. One of the things I've been working on, again, I like the whole idea that people just left a room. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on the, you know, little tiny, these are probably not anything you're going to be able to see. I love those. Uh, little vignettes. So it's like a little kitchen 
Oops. I what is the, it. what's the box made of? The plexi box, is it plexi? It's um, handmade out of a uh, slide plastic. Ah, slide and plastic. I'm, and I'm, you know, that you, you like cover slides, slides and cover slides. Yeah. So it's, um, but I have to find some better ways of doing that. But yeah, any plastic I found was just too thick. So I just love the idea of um, little vignettes. Somebody just left a room, they were cooking or they were playing the piano or they were looking at their uh, collection. So I wanna make some more vignettes, but I don't know what's at the top of the list. I'll tell you another baby house is not at the top. <laughs> I well, I love those vignettes. Those are awesome. I didn't see those. That's a new one for me. All right, let's see if there are any other questions. As we're winding down this session, does anybody have any other question? We got some nice, really feedback about your teaching. She, someone, uh, Sabrina said you're an awesome teacher. I'm sure that's Ooh, true. How nice. Thank you. Um, somebody wants to see the thorn rooms. I don't know if you have them there, but they are not in here. And if I try to leave this yeah. room right this minute, I hear you. Loud noises that will involve clutter. <laughs> But um, yeah, I do have some photos on my website in the gallery on my website. Yeah, and that's a good point. If you guys want to see more of Fran's work, we, we have um, your um, web address in the chat box. So definitely go there for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this has been super awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this time and sharing your, your knowledge and know-how and your beautiful work. Thank you, um, thank you. Yeah. So like I said, folks, if you need to find um, Fran, we have just posted. Thank you, Donald, for putting the information in the chat box. You guys know where to find me. I want to thank you, Fran, again, for spending this time with us. And you guys all out there for spending time with us. Thank you for being here today. And Fran, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Yay. <laughs>